Okay, welcome back for the, this uh, final part uh, of the um, second day of the conference. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I introduce the second uh, high order beat uh, talk of today. And our speaker is Joe Ito, CEO of Creative Commons, uh, who is going to share with us uh, his thoughts about uh, university and cyberspace. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Juan Carlos. <coughs> so I'm going to be very low tech and not use any slides. Um, so I dropped out of college. I actually dropped out of college twice, which probably makes me the most uneducated person to speak today. And, um, but I wanted to, you know, but I still get invited to conferences. I still am able to somehow survive without having graduated from university. I mean, in fact, some of my best friends are at universities and I still teach at universities. But somehow this complete failure of formal education in my youth didn't completely hamper me from living a normal life. And I think that um, the only reason I was able to survive my failure in um, formal education was because of the internet. And I think the internet isn't just a technology. It's not like a telephone. It's not like just computers. It's actually a fundamental philosophical change in the way that we do things. And it's that change that made it successful as infrastructure for uh, telecommunications. But the Philosophy is something that's, uh, I think, very important because it ties into all the things that touch the internet, whether we're talking about education or publishing or music. And so I think it's, first of all, important maybe a little bit to discuss the philosophy of the internet um, and how it ties into, for instance, how one person may lead their life and another person may lead their life. Um, but first of all, I will say before I go out and preach my philosophy, is that um, I'm not a monophilosophist. Uh, my sister is an academic, and she has two PhDs. And after she became a successful academic, she decided to study learning because she was confused as to how I was still able to survive, even though I completely failed at that thing that she was good at. Um, but I, so I think that for certain types of people and certain types of discipline, formal systems work. But I think there is a new kind of learning an informal learning, which is very important, which wasn't possible before. So it's not or, I think it's an and. It's, there's a new kind of participation, a new kind of innovation that the internet enables, which I think we need to think about. There's a great book uh, by John Seeley Brown, John Hagel, and uh, Lang Davidson called The Power of Pull. And I'm not promoting it because I'm in the book as an example, but I do think it's a good book. And the basic notion of the book, wow, I feel like a star now. The, 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 the basic notion of the book is that in the past what you would do is you would stock information and you would stock resources and you would centrally plan these operations and push those resources and information out and it was really centrally controlled, centrally planned and, are, and they, they're both from Deloitte or they're all from Deloitte so they do a fairly interesting rigorous analysis and I have to make sure I end on um, analysis about how IT and all these new advances really haven't increased the performance of these older institutions which are centrally planned and centrally controlled. But he says that there's a new kind of uh, innovation, a new kind of thinking, which is they call a power of pull. And the idea is that instead of stocking and pushing, what you do is you sort of pick a trajectory, you sort of head towards that trajectory, and interesting serendipitous events will happen. And you embrace those serendipitous events, and you pull the resources together as you need to, instead of stocking them. And in, the, in, in this kind of network, the innovation happens on the edges. So it's very important to pay attention to the edges of your organization, rather than the center of your organization. And it's really about distribu distributed uh, networks, rather than central planning. And so um, I think that that is enabled, and it very, is very much like how the internet works. And so I, I want to describe a little bit about the internet. So the internet, for people who aren't geeks, you might not look at it this way, but for someone who's partially geek, I look at it as a, a, a stack of layers. And then each layer you have a standard, like TCP IP or Ethernet or the web standard, HTML. And each standard is basically run by a non-governmental body, like the World Wide Web Consortium or the Internet Engineering Task Force. It's generally lightweight and ad hoc, and it focuses on interoperability and uh, standardization and allowing people to participate without asking permission. It's trying to lower friction. And the success of the internet has been that all of these standards are quite lightweight 
and they're an iterative process of evolution rather than the old way, which was, for instance, the ITU, uh, they had, you know, the, I don't know how many of you remember X25, which was the competing packet switching network to TCP IP when the internet was coming out. But that was a bunch of experts hired by big telephone companies and government who would get together in institutions once a year or however many, um, the, whatever the cycle was, and they would sit and try to anticipate every single possible problem that might happen in the network, and they would create this huge specification that no one human being would ever be able to interpret, and this huge specification would have every possible thing planned out, and then it would, because it's so huge, would be farmed out to huge uh, laboratories and companies that would then implement the standard, and then they will have a long process, and the cost would be very high. It would be robust in a particular way. And so like the GSM standard and the um, um, WCADMA, these all go through this kind of very long cycle. And for hard infrastructure, it kind of makes sense, because once you put it in place, it's very difficult to change, and so on and so forth. And it's true that on the internet, we sometimes get it wrong. We didn't anticipate spam. We didn't anticipate a, a bunch of things that we have problems with. Having said that, the question is, would it have made sense to spend five more years figuring out whether spam would happen and to prevent it in a, ahead of time in the specification? And in most cases, 99% of these edge cases actually never happen. Or spam was a pain for us for a while, but somehow we, the immune system of the internet has evolved so that spam is a little less painful than it was a couple of years ago. And so I think the idea of the internet is that by allowing participation and allowing a kind of innovation to happen as a, uh, as a process of, um, uh, and David Weinberger uses the word small pieces loosely joined, it's a very informal network, um, which is more robust and which is uh, more innovative. I, I think just specifically with spam, this is another in issue of central planning versus evolution. You know, I think if um, uh, a man named Hiroaki Kitano uh, gave a very interesting metaphor, and he studies systems biology of the human body, and he talks about the human immune system. And the immune system is very interesting. If you develop a human being in a complete clean room, absent any kind of bacteria or, or, or hostile germs, they will grow into a very fragile human being, and the minute they walk outside, they will be, uh, they, they're likely to die um, from infection. And it's only through eating sand and falling and hurting yourself that the immune system develops as a child so that when you become an adult, you have a system that can tell the difference between good or bad. Sometimes you get allergies and it has to evolve some more. But the immune system is a system that gets better by being constantly attacked by things that may be the enemy, things that may be internal. And I think that that kind of evolution is the kind of evolution that we're trying to do with the internet. We're not trying to protect the internet from every possible thing before it touches it it gets infected, it, it fails, and it, it tries to learn from the failure. This is very difficult when the cost of failure is very high. And so this is the other problem is when you have large institutions or large companies or large budgets, if every swing of the bat is gonna cost you a lot of money, um, you can't really fail that much. So the typical Japanese telephone company, for them to try a project, let's say you wanna try open education, we wanna try a search engine, this probably costs hundreds of millions of dollars and decades of work. Whereas somebody in the open source community can try Linux among the other hundreds of things that were tried that day on Usenet. And some of them will succeed and some of them will fail, but the point is that the cost of failure is nearly zero, so we can try a lot of things. And what's really important to think about when we think about the internet and internet innovation is everything that's really cool about the internet is only obvious in retrospect. You know, eBay, Wikipedia, um, even the web itself probably would not be funded at the you know, in, in a substantial scale if they were proposals within a large corporation or a large academic institution. They were successful because they tried everything, and whether it was timing or whether it happened to be the right idea, some things are successful and some things aren't successful. And this is internet innovation, this is how venture capital works, is how do you lower the cost of innovation to the point where everybody can try everything, and then those things that are successful are then um, promoted and, 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 and become important. And even today, if you look at our financial systems, if you look at every single problem, there's a, sort of the, the, the famous book, The Black Swan, but it's, there's many books like this, which is just about every major event that we have, we didn't predict, right? So if we're arguing central planning, which we know in governments also, we, we, we're starting to try to get away from, but, but planning and being methodical versus lowering risk and iterating, which is gonna be more robust 
in a network where we don't have enough information to plan what we do, right? And so that's, I think, the philosophy of the internet and why the internet was successful. And each layer of the internet is, is another layer where we're trying to create this open standard and interoperability that dramatically lowers the cost and allows people to participate so that innovation can happen more cheaply and can involve more players, more innovators. Creative Commons is actually another layer on the internet. So now the web has been created this way for all of us to be able to bring tons and tons of people together at a very, very low cost, people who couldn't come together before. So in the past, Charlie Nesson may have gone to Cambridge and they would sip champagne and they would discuss a collaboration that would cost millions of dollars and the legal fees could have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but that would be fine. Charlie would be able to get a, a write off for that because in the scope of the whole project, the $100,000 in legal fees was minimal. But today, we can have students here talking to students in Croatia, and they can have a plan to collaborate on the internet, and the cost of that collaboration is so cheap because all of the other layers have become nearly free. But $100,000, $10,000, $5,000 in legal fees will break the deal because it will exceed the cost of the transaction, the value of the transaction. And so what we've done, if you think about it, the internet, what does it do? It allows people to participate without asking permission and transmits information at a nearly zero cost. So what is it doing? It's, it's convening people and allowing people to learn. Well, what are universities supposed to do, right? We convene people, bring them together, and we help them learn. Because I, I think I don't like being educated, but I like to learn, right? And so, so part of this, though, then, is, well, before, in the old days, before we had the internet, you know, it was very expensive to bring people together. It was very expensive to disseminate information. And so what you had to do with limited resources was you had to allocate it very carefully to the brightest people in your society because they were the only ones worth investing this tremendous amount of resources to. That was because there was a scarcity. It was so expensive to convene, so expensive to disseminate information. But as the cost of dissemination has become nearly zero, as the cost of collaboration has become nearly zero, do we still need to centrally plan these resources that the universities currently hold? Now, this is the kind of interesting point because I do think there is a value to university. There is a value to the convening, all this, the knowledge that we have. So I'm not for obliterating the university, but I am for trying to create a way, a pathway, a connection with those, people, those of us outside of the formal education network so that we can participate too, so that we can somehow contribute to the body of human knowledge that is sort of encapsulated in the system of university and also benefit from the access to knowledge that you already have. Because one of the things, and this is really the, probably the stickiest, trickiest, and most emotionally charged part of all of this, is as the internet comes, it starts to deteriorate the business models of those people who created some of the fundamental pillars of education. It's the academic publishers who coordinated the peer review to make sure that the physics journal didn't die. These people did a really, really important service throughout history in disseminating knowledge to all of the universities. In fact, though, that their business model is now being attacked by and is in jeopardy because of the internet, because you can do a lot of what they do without the substantial costs. Universities themselves, you know, the university gives credit. And for instance, I can't get a passport or, or, or a visa on the uh, Singapore website. I have to call the prime minister's office to get a visa to Singapore. I have to use a sheik to get my driver's license in the UAE because they filter everybody by university degrees. And so the university degree has become a kind of currency that people can use to charge people to sit in a chair but not give credit for people who are learning things informally. And that's also a business model, and I, I admit that that's not probably what most universities are sitting around thinking about, but it does create a kind of complacency on the part of universities because they have this currency that is currently traded to separate the riffraff from the smart people, right? And so what happens is it tends to take people like me who, if I didn't have forgiving parents, I probably wouldn't be allowed to have dropped out of college, and I would have probably spent 10 extra years of my time sitting and listening to professors and not actually listening, instead of being on the internet and actually learning the way I like to learn. And so I think one of the, the other questions which is really important is how do we create a system of mutual respect and think about the commons, think about all of those informal learners that we're letting go, think about all of those universities that can't afford the academic journals that cost tens of thousands of dollars to subscribe to, and think about how we can improve, I think, what the fundamental um, reason for universities should be, which is to bring people together and to help people learn. How can we focus on that? And I think part of that is going to be about allowing this sort of um, access without 
uh, permission and this kind of collaboration and information to be a little bit more free. And I do think that the, 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 the each layer of the internet gives us another explosion of innovation. And I think that Creative Commons is the next layer of the internet. And just like the web created eBay and Wikipedia and, and Amazon, I think that Creative Commons is going to create a whole bunch of new ideas, which I think a lot of people have talked about, including uh, open education and open educational resources and things like that. But we should look at it as an opportunity to innovate and an opportunity to make learning and convening better rather than a threat to the current business model, which it is. But we have to, I think, think about it in a different way to be move forward. Thank you. One or two quick questions to Joy Ito before we move on to the next session. No, I cannot believe it. <laughs> Maybe there are too many yourself censoring yourself. Thank you again. Thank you. One of the speakers will speak in Italian, so in case you're not fluent with Italian, you might want to get the translation, the simultaneous translation.